participants, thanks for joining. Um, today we're going to talk about the down and dirty crash course in commonly used ICU medications. So let's just start by basically talking about hemodynamics and our decision making process as we move through some of these medications. So what actually makes up your blood pressure, right? We've got three main things. We've got our pump, our volume, and our squeeze. So the pump is the heart. And so anything that's interfering with the inotropy, that's the force of the muscular contraction, the chronotropy, which is the heart rate, or cardiac output is a pump problem. For your volume, anything that's affecting the circulating amount of volume in your blood vessels is the problem. And for your squeeze, anything affecting the squeeze of the arterial vasculature is your problem. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But you can see here, cardiac output is made up of, here's your pump, right? So it's made up of your heart rate times your stroke volume, okay? And your stroke volume is made up of two things as well. How much actual blood volume you have, so how much is in the pipes, and what your vascular resistance is. So how tight or loose those blood vessels are. Because you can imagine if you've got a big loose blood vessel with a little bit of volume, you're not gonna get a whole lot of stroke volume coming out with each beat. You've got a really tight blood vessel and a lot of volume, you're gonna have a lot of stroke volume coming out with each beat. Now, if you're in a situation where you have a hypotensive patient and you're not really sure where to start, think of this phrase, quickly fill and squeeze the pump. And it's going to help you go through the entire process as to what is your patient's problem and how can you best fix it. So you start with quickly, the word quickly. So quickly means you want to assess your heart rate. Is it too fast or is it too slow? If it's too fast, your heart might not be able to fill. So if you have it and it's going like this, it's not allowing enough filling time for blood to actually fill into the, the pericardium to be able to squeeze out and have any meaningful stroke volume. Okay, is it too slow? where it's beating slow, incredibly slowly that the tissues aren't perfusing. Now, let's say your patient's hypotensive, but their heart rate is normal, it's 90. And so you say, all right, well, I know that's not the problem. Well, now I'm gonna go to number two. So that's gonna be my fill. Do they need any volume, okay? Are they bleeding or do they have um, a concern of bleeding? Are they dehydrated? Do they potentially need just fluid resuscitation? Um, so that's where you're starting to do your quickly, your heart rate's okay, your fill, you're assessing your fluid status. Now let's say you feel they're well fluid resuscitated. They have moist mucous membranes. They have no evidence of bleeding and they have no really clear reason to be bleeding based off of their history and their assessment. Maybe we need to go to, to the third piece, squeeze. So do they need a squeeze? So in some situations like septic shock, you have this massive vasodilation that happens. And so all those blood vessels just relax. And when blood vessels relax, that blood pressure lowers. So maybe they need a little help with a squeeze. So now we're talking vasopressors. And we're going to go through some of the vasopressors in a little bit. So let's say we did our heart rate. We assessed our fluid status. We assessed if our vascular tree needed a little bit of a squeeze. What if we get to all of that and we say, you know, none of these are the problem. Well, then the final thing is your pump. You have a pump failure. So the heart is needing support. So there are some inotropic medications that we'll discuss, um, but then that's really getting them to a tertiary care center where they can get additional support, whether that be an impella, um, that be a balloon pump, uh, escalating all the way up to ECMO if they're in full fluid cardiac failure. Okay, so a couple of extra little things here, but wait, there's more. So when we talk about volume resuscitation, we really want to make sure that we adequately volume resuscitate our patients before we ever start them on vasopressors. And that's why it's the second step when we do quickly fill and squeeze the pump. We wanna fill and fix that problem before we move on to the next one, which is the squeeze. Because you can imagine if you've got these blood vessels that have no volume in them, it doesn't really matter how much you squeeze if that volume's not there. So that's why we do the stepwise approach of the quickly fill and squeeze the pump. Selecting and titrating the medications. So there are several different vasopressors and inotropes that we're gonna talk about. Um, but you wanna pick the initial one based off of the underlying cause of shock. And when we titrate, we wanna titrate to achieve an effective blood pressure or end organ perfusion, all right? So what is an effective blood pressure? It kind of varies patient to patient. You could have some patients that are chronically hypotensive and maybe they always run with a map of 55 and that's appropriate for them. You have some patients that are chronically hypertensive and they can actually have mental status changes if their MAP drops below 75. You really have to determine what is important for your patient in that clinical situation. And then end organ perfusions, 
those are things like your mentation, your urine output, because what that's telling you is that organ, the brain, the kidneys are getting enough blood and enough oxygen perfusion to be able to function appropriately. And if those things start to change, you start to lose your mentation, your urine, out, your urine output drops down, then you know that you're having perfusion issues. So those are some great ways to be able to closely monitor that. We talk about a route of administration. For vasopressors and ionotropes, ideally the patient should have a central line. However, it's not absolutely required. So I would never want you to not give a medication that the patient needs in order to save their life because you are concerned that you only have a peripheral IV. What you do want for your peripheral IV is to make sure that it flushes very well. Ideally, you can get blood return from it, just confirming that it's not infiltrated and it's a really good place. And then you just want to frequently assess if you're having to put some of these medications through a peripheral IV. And if we can get to the point where we get a central access, that's fantastic. Um, another thing is that you can put these medications through an IO safely as well, if that's your only other option. And when you monitor these patients, um, you know, in some situations it would be ideal to have an arterial line, but we don't have the, the monitoring capabilities of, uh, and placement capabilities of doing arterial lines. So um, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we are checking our blood pressure about every five minutes. Cause when you do a um, peripheral blood pressure, it's kind of hard to do it really frequently. It can sometimes skew your numbers. So about every five minutes while you're increasing that medication, while you're trying to say, okay, I haven't gotten to a good place yet. I'm not seeing an improvement in my blood pressure. I need to keep starting to go up and up and up. You want to be monitoring those vitals frequently to make sure that you're not having a worsening of your vitals, right? And then once you've stabilized, you've gotten to a point where you say, hey, my medication's been at this rate for a while and my blood pressure's been stable for a while, then maybe you can back off and, and be monitoring about every minutes. And let's go into a little bit about shock because we've talked some about volume and pumps and um, pipes and, and all sorts of things. So what is shock? Shock is a state in which the body's tissues aren't getting enough blood flow for one reason or another. And that's, that's really the basis of it, right? And so what happens when this happens? That peripheral vasculature clamps down, your cells, they switch from using aerobic respiration, which is using the oxygen that they're getting from that well-perfused blood. Well, now that they're not getting that well-perfused blood, now they're switching to anaerobic respiration. And when you switch to anaerobic respiration, the byproduct is lactic acid. And because of the lack of perfusion, that builds up. And then you end up seeing patients that have a metabolic acidosis. As your metabolic acidosis worsens, it can actually be really difficult to manage the blood pressure using vasopressors because the majority of your vasopressors work the best if your pH is greater than 7.1. And when your pH drops below 7.1, the efficacy of the uh, or efficiency of the um, vasopressors actually starts to diminish a little bit. So it can be a little bit harder to manage those patients, which is why we want to do everything that we can to make sure that we avoid severe acidosis, or that we work on reversing the severe acidosis as much as possible. All right, so we've got a couple of different shock-like states. So there's three main ones that I kind of want to focus on in this. We've got a volume problem, a squeeze problem, and a pump problem. So our volume problem is our hypovolemic shock. And it kind of depends on what type of shock this is. It can either be from bleeding, so it's a loss of blood, or it can be from a loss of fluid, insensible fluid loss, dehydration. So depending on what it is, you want to replenish whatever the patient needs replenishing. If they're bleeding, give them blood. If they're dehydrated, they just went out and ran a marathon, it's 110 degrees, and now they're coming in, give them fluids, okay? Our squeeze problem. Squeeze problem is mostly associated with septic shock. There are a, a couple of other things that it could be, but primarily we're going to focus on septic shock. So those germs floating around in your systemic circulation, right? They start to secrete endotoxins and the endotoxins can affect those arterial vessels, which loosen up and then your blood pressure starts to fall. So that's when we say, hey, we wanna do that squeeze. We wanna give them a little extra. We see that sometimes with our septic shock patients. And then our pump problems, again, cardiogenic shock. Our heart is failing. The simple way to put it is that the blood pressure is low because the pump isn't pumping, right? So. You can see this in patients uh, with really massive MIs, end-stage heart disease, cardiomyopathies, if they've had multiple heart attacks before, and so they have a really low ejection fraction, normally F being about 50 to 70%. You cannot see some people that um, have pretty significant cardiac history that only have an EF of about 7 to 10%. And you can imagine that if that's the ejection fraction is that low, 
that even the smallest of tasks can put them out of breath and um, hypotensive and tachycardic and have a pretty severe response. So just kind of keep these things in mind as you're working through that quickly fill and squeeze the pump. And then as we talk about some of these other medications moving forward. So when we talk about vasopressors, there's a couple of different receptors that I think it's kind of helpful to understand so that you can understand how the medications work and why we select certain medications for certain conditions. So there are three major adrenergic receptors that we're gonna focus on. The first being alpha. And your alpha receptors live in your arteries, so your AA, so that one's kind of nice, right? Your beta-1 receptors, they live in the heart. So if you think about it, you can see right here in this picture, if you turn your B on its side, it kind of looks like uh, the top part of a heart. Okay, and your beta-2 receptors live in the lungs. And if you have two Bs, it kind of like looks like it's put along. All right. So how do we care or why do we care? Well, alpha receptors, if they work on the arteries, you know that you're going to get a nice squeeze. Okay. Beta-1 receptors, when they work in the heart, sometimes you can still get a squeeze in those arteries. But what you also get is you get support with the heart. So you can get an increased chronotropy and inotropy. Beta-2 receptors that you see in the lungs are going to more support the lungs. So that's how we're going to talk about these moving forward. And I'm going to give examples for each of the medications that we're going to talk about. And then just take it one step further when you talk about medications that agonize or antagonize. If you're agonizing a set of receptors, that means you're stimulating them. So you're making them do what they already want to do. So an example is if you agonize the alpha receptors in the arteries, the arteries tighten up because that's what the alpha receptors want to do. They want to tighten up. When you antagonize a receptor, it means you block what they want you to do. So if you antagonize those same alphas, then the arteries loosen up. Make sense? Okay. You can see this chart here where it breaks down the four most common vasopressors that we use. Um, and you can see kind of how they pan out. So on something like epinephrine, you can see that it actually affects all three areas. It affects your arteries, it affects your heart, and it affects your lungs. Dopamine affects the same three, but maybe just a little less than epi. Phenylephrine only affects your arteries. Doesn't do anything for the heart, doesn't do anything for the lungs. And norepi only affects your arteries and only affects your heart. So it's a little helpful to think of it this way when you're trying to pick an appropriate medication. So let's go into details about some of these meds. So norepinephrine or levofed has a common dose range of 0.5 to 30 mics per minute. You can see that escalated past 30 in um, peri arrest or cardiac arrest situations. Here we mix four milligrams and 250 mLs, and that's how our IV pump is programmed. It is the most commonly used presser. Um, back in the day, they used to say levofed, leave them dead. And now it has become the first line in almost all hypotensive patients um, because it just works really well. It stimulates your alpha and your beta one receptors. And so what that does is it increases the contractility and it increases the heart rate while it simultaneously causes some vasoconstriction, a little squeeze in those vessels. So you're now supporting a little bit of the heart and a little bit of the, the vessels with the squeeze. And so that helps to increase that systemic blood pressure. It works very nicely. Again, before you start a vasopressor, what do you want to do? You want to make sure you fix that hypovolemia if they have any. Make sure they're fluid resuscitated. We're checking their blood pressure every five minutes as we're up titrating. Then we can drop it to about every 15 minutes once we've reached a stable pressure. You don't want to abruptly discontinue this, right? We want to titrate it slowly down because if you can imagine the body is starting to get accustomed to having this level of support. And if you get them up to say 10 mics per minute of levofed, and their blood pressure looks good, and you say, yeah, I don't think they need to be on this anymore, and you stop it, you're going to lose all that good progress that you had. So all of these medications, you titrate them up, and then you have to titrate them back down in order to get them off. They're not something that you can just stop. Again, we talked about the central line before. You want to be really careful if you're using a peripheral IV that you just monitor your peripheral IV frequently, all right? Just have a really good sense of how it's working. Is it flushing well? Is it sitting around it looking good? And then realize that sometimes in some patients, when you start something like levofed, um, you can actually see a little bit of bradycardia and some arrhythmias. It's not very common, but it's something that you could potentially see. So just be aware of that and keep that in mind. Another medication that's really um, helpful to use, and remember epinephrine was the one that touched on all of those receptors, alpha, the beta one and the beta two, so the arteries, heart and lungs, um, is a really nice catch-all. 
And so the normal dose range is two to 30 mics per minute. And you can see how they're fairly similar, right? Leave a and Epi, the doses are fairly similar. So it helps um, to remember it a little bit easier. Here we mix one milligram and 250 mLs. Again, it works on the alpha, beta one and beta two receptors. And so it's used in a lot of different things. You can, we know that we use it in um, ACLS, right? We have uh, V-fib, PA, asystole, bradycardia. It's the first line for anaphylaxis because why do you think? It also is, is supporting the lungs. So you're, you're actually causing some vasodilation in the lungs, but you're causing vasoconstriction in the vessels. And uh, so it works really nicely in that situation. And then also for patients in shock light state. So it, it promotes that bronchial smooth muscle relaxation, but that cardiac stimulation. So a couple of considerations though, it can cause dysrhythmias because it increases the myocardial oxygen demand. So think about your heart, right? Your heart is now kind of out of shape and it's been running this race for a long time and it's really struggling to keep up. And suddenly you add something like Epi and it's making it beat a little faster and the vascular is a little tighter and everything's working a little bit more. Because if you remember from the slide before, epinephrine works a little bit heavier on some of those receptors than norepinephrine. So it can cause palpitations, PPCs, um, supraventricular tachycardia, ventricle arrhythmias potentially, due to the, the beta stimulation of the myocardium and the conduction system. So if you start epinephrine and you see that they're having a tachycardic response or they're throwing a lot of PVCs, um, just go talk to your doc and say, hey, I don't know if this is really working that great for us. I just started it, it's only at five mics. I'm seeing some EKG changes that might just be a little bit too much. Um, it's not really a medication that you necessarily want to give a patient that's having an MI because that heart has already been running that marathon and is already exhausted. So keep those things in mind as you're working through some of these medication choices. And again, watch your vitals every five minutes going up. And then once it's stabilized, you can kind of um, stabilize it out to about every 15 minutes. Back. Dopamine is another great one. Common dose range is two to 20 mics per kilo per minute. Um, it comes in a pre-mixed bag, which is really nice so that you can really just grab it pretty quickly. And it hits on a variety of receptors. Um, it's usually not seen as a first or second line presser, but it does help to increase that blood pressure and your mean arterial pressure. So your MAP, because it increases myocardial contractility and the peripheral that vasoconstriction. Okay. Um, but you do want to make sure that you monitor their urine output, um, their cardiac output, so you can um, assess the peripheral pulses, their blood pressure. Um, be really cautious with this one when it comes to your IV. If you have an extra, um, an extra avisation, um, then you just want to make sure that you let your provider know because sometimes you actually need to use ventolamine, which is a medication that you inject around the area. So like, let's say you have an IV infiltrate, you actually inject around the subcutaneous tissue um, to almost like absorb that, that medication that can cause uh, necrotic tissue. And Keep in mind that dopamine is one that can cause tachyarrhythmias as well. Um, and so if you develop any new arrhythmias or new tachycardias, again, talk with the provider and see if maybe there would be another medication that we could switch to. Dopamine used to be a pretty popular one to use and we just don't see it as much anymore. So if it's something that's fairly new um, to you or you haven't done it in a while, just go ahead and look up your references. Um, we have the IV drug library reference guide um, and in the code cart binder on top of the code carts, there's also additional information. So if you are using something that you haven't seen in a while, just make sure you use those resources. And then phenylephrine. Uh, phenylephrine or neosinephrine, those are the two names for it. Dose range is about 40 to 180 mics per minute, but you can go up to about 300 if you're in a, in a code situation. And we put 10 milligrams in a 250 ml bag of normal saline. Now this was the one that's the selective alpha receptor agonist. So what does that mean? That means it only affects the arteries and all it does is tighten. That's it. So you have pretty significant vasoconstriction and there's really minimal or no cardiac inotropy or chronotropy. So there's no increase in the contractility or the heart rate. So it increases the blood pressure, but it doesn't necessarily improve the perfusion to the tissues or support the heart. So this is one that's really nice in the OR um, for propofol-induced hypotension. So we see a lot of patients that either get induced with propofol um, or if they're doing a conscious sedation, they may use propofol and propofol is something that causes some vasodilation. And we're actually gonna talk about propofol in a few minutes. Um, 
and that's all it does is it just causes a little too much vasodilation. You give a little bit of neosinephrine, it gives a little bit of that squeeze to reduce the effects of the propofol and everything goes back to normal and is happy. So it's really nice for that. Um, it's also really great for spinal shock because when you have a patient that has spinal shock below the level of injury for severe spinal shock, they actually don't have any sympathetic tone anymore. And so the vasculature just kind of like, oh, like total relaxation. So you can see a pretty significant dump in their blood pressure and they'll also be bradycardic as well. Um, and so neosinephrine can be really nice there because all it's doing is giving the squeeze that the body can no longer supply. Um, you will sometimes see though, in really escalating, uh, acidotic or septic patients that neosinephrine or phenylephrine ends up as like a third presser. So you'd start with Levo and then you might add Epi and then we're going to talk about Vaso in a minute. So hopefully you added some Vaso. And so phenylephrine might be your third or fourth agent in that situation as well. Uh, cause again, it is going to give you that squeeze. It can cause reflex bradycardia and, and really severe vasoconstriction though. So um, it's not something that the ICUs routinely like to keep on for a long period of time because you can actually see a lot of necrosis in fingers and toes as you can with some of the other vasopressors, but really with Neo because it's just that arterial tightening. Okay, so vasopressin. Vasopressin is actually one of my favorites. Um, so it's an antidiuretic hormone and it tends to be used as the second line especially in sepsis management. A lot of times you'll see levofed go on first and then they'll say, hey, let's go ahead and throw on some vasopressor, um, some vasopressin. And the reason that vasopressin works so well, um, that I think it works so well, and what I've seen work so well is that it is not affected by the pH. So like we talked about before, a pH of about 7.1, anything less than that, your vasopressors start to be a little less effective. You're gonna know that they significantly go up on their uh, demand of vasopressors. So you're up titrating it. Vasopressin doesn't care really about the pH. It just works on its own on different pathways. And so it's an excellent one to be able to just put on. It's a set it and forget it. We mix 20 units in a hundred ml bag here and it runs at 0.04 units per minute. And that's it. It doesn't get titrated. It doesn't have to change. It's an on. And then when it doesn't need to be on anymore, it's an off. It's the only one that does that. Um, and it does work really well in your acidotic patients. So you can actually see somewhat of a stabilization in those patients where say you're going up and up and up on the levo and they're saying, all right, we might have to add epi and you go on the epi and you go up and up and up. And then you put vasopressin on and everything just kind of settles. And then as you fix the acidosis, you're gonna start to see that you can come down on the levo and the epi and then you get one of them off and say the epi's off and now you just have levo and you keep coming down on the levo. And then when you get a nice low dose of the levo, you might be able to say, all right, you know what, we're not acidotic anymore and we're on a low dose levo, let's go ahead and get rid of that vasopressin. So it's a really nice bridge to get you to a point where you can kind of start working on that acidosis a little bit better. I do wanna just mention dibutamine. Um, it's not a vasopressor, it's an ionotrope. Not to be confused with dopamine because they're two very different things. Dopamine is a vasopressor, it has a little bit of ionotropic properties, but it's a vasopressor. Dibutamine is a true ionotrope. And what it does is it actually causes vasodilation. So there are um, the beta-1 receptors effect increases the contractility, so that inotropy, and increases the rate, the chronotropy, but it causes some vasodilation in the periphery. Why would that actually be beneficial for us? Well, what it's doing is it's helping to support the heart beating faster and stronger and better but it's reducing the amount of pressure that the heart's pushing against. So all of our other vasopressors, vessels, the vessels tighten, and then the heart squeeze kind of increases. But what if we have a dying heart, right? And it's having a really hard time. You don't necessarily want to tighten these vessels even more to make it harder for the heart to pump. You actually kind of want the vessels to relax a little bit so that that heart can pump and kind of overcome the damage that it has. And so dibutamine is something where it gives that extra uh, support to the heart itself, but then causes a little vasodilation in the periphery to make it easier. Well, then what happens? Well, then you have somebody that is still hypotensive. And so what you'll see sometimes is that you'll actually, when you start to be in mean, you'll see it worsening in your blood pressure. And so you actually have to start a vasopressor to kind of help support the blood pressure a little bit, but the inotropic properties that are supporting the heart are needed so you're in this kind of balance game. And that's why we really don't see dibutamine outside of cardiac ICUs um, because 
ideally you have the ability to really closely monitor their cardiac output with more invasive monitoring that we just don't have. Okay, so we talked about vasopressors and if we have vasopressors to bring up our blood pressure, then what do we have to bring down our blood pressure? Well, we've got our vasodilators. Okay, so our first one that we're gonna talk about, uh, nitroglycerin. Normal dose range is about 10 to 200 mics per minute. It's mixed 50 milligrams in a 250 ml normal saline bag, and it is a nitrate and a strong vasodilator. So it actually dilates both your coronary arteries and your peripheral vasculature. So it just kind of helps relax the vessels that are maybe a little too tense. So now we're in the opposite world, right? Before everything was loosey goosey. Now we're in a too tense situation. You're going to start to see your blood pressure trend down as you start nitroglycerin. So there's a couple of things that you need to keep in mind though, when you're starting a nitro infusion, right? You have to be really cautious and ask your patient if they're on any home nitro and if they potentially took any before they just suddenly showed up to see you, or if they're on Viagra or a comparable erectile dysfunction medication, because if they are and you give nitro, it can cause life-threatening hypotension that can be very difficult to correct. So really just be aware, okay? Make sure you ask your patient. You may be embarrassed, you may be embarrassed, but you need to know the information. It does usually come in a glass bottle if it's pre-mixed. Um, so when you actually go to spike it, you know how there's that blue port on the top when you first spike your IV tubing that you can flip open, just like with propofol, because propofol is another bottle that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, that's the best way to be actually able to prime the medication. Sometimes if you don't pop that port open, then it's just not able to prime. Um, let's see, after you get it started, patients can complain of a headache because now they're having just this like massive vasodilation. So sometimes they can actually have a little bit of extra blood flow there that can, that can cause them to have a headache. And if they become severely hypertensive, just stop it. Half-life is only about one to four minutes. So it's usually out of their system pretty quickly. Um, if you stop it, you start a little fluid bolus and kind of help to fill those pipes up a little bit more now that they're a little too relaxed, give it a few minutes, medication wears off, kind of goes back to its normal tightness again, and then you can just continue to move forward. Another thing I want you to keep in mind with nitro is we see a lot of patients where they come in with EMS um, or say they show up to the ED and we give them a sublingual tab and they become hypotensive. And so we say, Oh, well, they can't go on a nitro infusion because they became hypotensive. Think about the dose. So when you have a patient that gets a sublingual tablet, uh, it's 0.4 milligrams per tablet, and that's 400 mics. Do you think that you just gave the patient 400 mics in a big bolus wallop dose, right? Sublingually. So I'm not surprised that it made them hypotensive right? Uh, some of these patients, especially if they were already kind of like, ah, they're 130s, and then you give it to them, they've never had it before. And it's like, whoo, that caused some pretty severe disease violation. Um, so if that happens, that doesn't mean that they can't go on an infusion, because look, can you start 10 mics per minute? All right. So if you do 10 times the 60, that's 600 mics, sure, over an hour, but it's over an entire hour. So just be really aware that when we give it IV, we start it slow and we can slowly titrate it up so it gently gets into their system and then slowly builds versus when we do something sublingual or even um, when we used to do a lot of like the pace, then it happens really quickly because they get absorbed all at the same time. So just really keep that in mind. It's not a contraindication of a patient to go on a nitro infusion if they reacted um, poorly to the sublingual. And then nitride, I'm just going to put a little post in here. Nitroprusside is very different from nitroglycerin. And nitroprusside is a very, very potent vasodilator. And it's really not one that we ever want to use if we don't have an arterial line because it, its onset is extremely rapid and its offset is extremely rapid. And so it's very difficult to titrate it safely just using a a blood pressure cuff, doing like a peripheral traditional blood pressure cuff. So not one that we're going to routinely hopefully see used um, because of its potency. And nitroglycerin just does such a nice job to help get that pressure down. All right. And then there's two calcium channel blockers that I want to talk about that um, are excellent medications and both have some really good purposes for different conditions. So we'll talk about diltiazem first. So diltiazem or cardizem, same medication. 
you can give a bolus with this and the actual bolus dose is 0.25 milligrams per kilogram over about five minutes. But what you see a lot of times ordered is um, like 25 milligrams and that's a full vial. Now, what I can tell you here is that when you're giving a bolus of something like diltiazem, um, you don't necessarily have to give the full dose that was ordered if you see the effect happen sooner. And I'll give an example of that. Um, if you have somebody, so the, the best thing, I guess moving ahead a little bit, um, it has antiarrhythmic and anti, antihypertensive properties, right? It's best used for AFib patients that are in a rapid ventricular response. Their heart rate is, is their ventricular response is really high, so their heart rate is high, um, and you're trying to help to get that heart rate down. And so a lot of times that's when you'll see a bolus is ordered, let's say, say the 25 milligram bolus, um, for a goal heart rate of less than 100. Now, let's say you're giving that bolus. This is something you want to give slow. This is not something you just push 25 milligrams, you walk out of the room and say, I'll come back in 15 minutes and see how you're doing. This is something where you sit at the bedside, you like start chatting about something, you know, because you're going to be there for a good five, 10 minutes as you're slowly giving the medication. And what I like to do is I just like to give it, um, it's typically 25 milligrams in five mLs. So I just like to give one mL slowly over about two or three minutes. And then I give them a minute. I will recycle a blood pressure if I can. I'll watch their heart rate. I'll give them a few, see how much they, they maybe come down on their heart rate to closer to my goal rate. And I might give another one ML, which is five milligrams. Do the same thing. Give it over about two minutes, maybe recycle a pressure, keep talking with them, seeing if anything's changing, seeing if they're feeling better, seeing if their heart rate's coming down. And if I get their heart rate below 100 on just 15 milligrams, or if I see that their blood pressure went from 130 to 90 systolic with just 15 milligrams, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. And I'm going to go to my provider and say, listen, I gave this much of the medication that you ordered. So 15 milligrams of the 25 milligram dose that you ordered. And I achieved either the goal heart rate and I'm starting the infusion now, or I kind of hit a roadblock because uh, she's more hypotensive, even though her heart rate is coming down. And so I, I'm kind of concerned about giving the rest don't feel like with really any medication that, that causes like a vasodilation. So you can even think of things like metoprolol. Don't ever feel like you have to give the whole dose because it's ordered. Be smart, be slow, slowly give the medication, see how they respond to it. And if they start having an adverse effect from that, you need to stop and use your critical thinking skills to say, is it safe for me to continue giving this medication or do I need to pause and pull in some extra help? So again, you frequently see a bolus with this, with this medication, and then a, an infusion starts right after. And so the, bol, uh, the dose range for the infusion is anywhere from five to 15 milligrams per hour, and you can titrate it every five minutes or so based on your necessity. Um, you mix 125 milligrams into a 100 ml bag, but because the 125 milligrams equals 25 mLs, when you add it to the 100 uh, ml bag, it becomes 125 mLs, so you have a one-to-one -one concentration. Um, again, be aware that it can cause severe hypotension, especially if you give that bolus too quickly, or if you increase the infusion rate also too quickly, you could give the whole 25 milligram bolus without a single issue. But if you increase that infusion rate too fast, then that's going to cause problems. Um, if for some reason you have severe complications or a severe side effect, um, or severe hypotension, the antidote to calcium channel blockers is calcium, right? If they're blocking the calcium receptors, then we give a little, a little extra calcium and maybe it kind of helps to combat that. So just think in mind that that's um, something that you could potentially see if you have an adverse reaction with giving diltiazem. We don't want to give it in a patient that has a wide complex tachycardia. Um, we do want to make sure that we monitor their blood pressure frequently, just like with the vasopressors, right? Because we know that we're actively affecting their hemodynamics. So we wanna know what's going on before we increase or change or decrease or, or anything. Um, and we wanna make sure that we watch their EKG for QRS widening. So it is a calcium channel blocker. So a calcium channel blocker, it slows the electrical response through the heart. So it can cause that QRS complex to elongate, which is problematic and sets the patient up for risk for arrhythmia. So, really just keep a close eye on that. And when you up titrate it, you can either up titrate by 2.5 milligrams an hour um, or a full five milligrams an hour. It depends on your patient and how they've been responding so far. So just, again, use your critical thinking skills to say, hey, is my patient gonna safely go from five milligrams to 
to 10 milligrams per hour? Or is it going to be safer for me to go to five to 7.5, give them about 15 minutes and see how they do there and then titrate up from there. And then our second uh, calcium channel blocker we're going to talk about is nicardipine, aka cardine. So the dose range for this is about five to 15 milligrams per hour again. Um, and so again, it kind of like helps you to remember the doses. And don't forget that you have your badge buddies that have all of these doses written out on here. So if you need one of these, please let me know. I have plenty made up um, and it's just kind of a, a quick reference guide to help you to remember. This is one that you wanna titrate every five to 15 minutes based off your patient response. And then what they traditionally say is even if you get up to 15 milligrams an hour, once they've stabilized their blood pressure, so let's say they've been consistent for a, about an hour or so, um, you can consider reducing it to three milligrams per hour after the response has been achieved. And that's because once it gets into the system and it starts working and functioning and it gets you the response that you want, you can actually drop it down to a lower maintenance rate and it'll still maintain that same response. But talk to the provider before you do something like that. Uh, 25 milligrams gets mixed in 250 ml saline bag. Again, it's a calcium channel blocker and an antihypertensive. Um, and it works really well as an antihypertensive, especially in strokes that need blood pressure management. Because what it does a little differently than something like diltiazem is it actually has vasospastic properties. So it helps to prevent vasospasms in the cerebral arteries, uh, in the cerebral blood vessels. And so when somebody has a stroke, you have a lot of concern that they could potentially have a seizure related to said stroke. Um, because you can have vasospasms from the lack of blood flow and the lack of perfusion. And so this just kind of helps to almost like relax those blood vessels a little bit as they're being relaxed in the vasodilatory effect. Can cause hypotension if titrated too quickly, just like any of these other vasodilators. So you just want to make sure that you're monitoring them closely like we are for the vasopressors and the other vasodilators that we have. Okay. So we've talked about our uppers with our blood pressure, our downers with our blood pressure. What about our sedation? So we've kind of covered the hemodynamics portion of critical care medications. And now we're gonna talk about um, the sedation part because this is a fine art as well when it comes to titrating. So um, I'm just gonna start going into a couple of different types that we have. So we'll start with propofol, all right? So Propofol, you can see a bolus range of anywhere from 10 to 40 milligrams is an IV push. And um, all of our infusions, they're all pre-mixed, they're all in bottles. And so there's either a big bottle or a little bottle. So the big bottle is 1,000 milligrams and 100 mLs, and the small bottle is 50 milligram, or, uh, 500 milligrams and 50 mLs. So you can see regardless of the bottle, the concentration is 10 milligrams per mL. So a lot of times if you're going to do a bolus, you could do it off of the IV pump itself by doing a bolus there, or you could take a syringe, go to the distal port at the top of the IV tubing and pull off one, two, three mLs, which would be 10, 20, 30 milligrams if your provider was asking you to do a bolus. Uh, it is a short acting lipophilic IV anesthetic. So what does that mean? That means that it likes fat, okay? So if you have a patient that is um, overweight or obese, it can actually take longer for this medication to wear off. It has a pretty quick onset offset. Anybody that's worked in the ICU will tell you that they have, uh, their attendings will come around and stop the propofol and go outside of the room to round for the 15, 20 minutes. And then by that time, the patient's up and awake and pulling at everything. And that's the sedation vacation. Well, it doesn't always work that way for somebody that's been on it for a long time or is, that is obese. So just kind of keep that in mind that it is lipophilic. Um, and because it's lipophilic, it actually has a higher chance of infection. So what we do is we change the bottle and tubing every 12 hours to decrease the, the risk of infection. And then we also try to keep it to a single port. So if you have a central line that you're using, say a central line was placed and you've got a triple lumen central line, you really want to try to keep it just on that one um, port consistently. And so then that way you're not starting it here and then you move it here and then you move it here. It just decreases your risk of infection if you keep it on that single port. And it can cause bradycardia and hypotension, especially as you start to increase it. The hypotension, I think everybody's pretty well aware of, but the bradycardia is not always as recognized um, as being propofol induced. And that's, you can start seeing as you get into more escalating doses or if you give um, too fast of a bolus or too much of a bolus. So keep that in mind that it can actually cause bradycardia as well. 
This metasomidine, aka Presidex, uh, is a nice medication that has both anesthetic and sedative properties. Um, the typical dose range is 0 0.2 to 1.5 mics per kilo per hour, and it's 400 mics is mixed in 100 mLs, or you could do a 200 mics mixed in 50 mLs. Again, it can cause hypotension and bradycardia, especially if you're increasing it too quickly. So in, in this one, unlike the others where you can up titrate every like five minutes or so is needed, this one we actually try not to titrate any faster than every 30 minutes because that helps to decrease the um, incidence of hypotension. The other interesting thing with Presidex is that it can actually be used on patients that are not intubated. So all of these other medications that we're gonna talk about for sedation and for pain can all, all cause uh, respiratory depression and Presidex doesn't. And so this can be one that's really nice for a patient that's in alcohol withdrawal um, or a patient that is maybe intubated and has a history of IV drug use and you know, you're having trouble maintaining them on some of the other medications. And so you kind of add this on board, you just have a little bit of that underlying calming effect. So um, it does have some pretty good uses. Personally, the Danielism, I haven't found it to be very um, beneficial in my acute patients. Um, and I haven't found it to be very beneficial in transport situations because again, it just kind of has that like baseline underlying calm. It doesn't really seem to do a great job at fully sedating. Um, and so you just want to keep that in mind if you're having to move a patient, make sure that they're adequately sedated for the transfer, the move, the actual bumpiness of the move versus them just being in a quiet room with the lights out, you know, being able to rest. Midazolam, aka Versed, uh, is an infusion that we could do. There is a bolus potential here as well, one to four milligrams based off of your provider. And then the dose range is about one to 10 milligrams an hour. You mix 100 milligrams and 100 mLs. Typically, pharmacy mixes this for us because we usually don't have enough of the vials available uh, in the department, but you can definitely check in your Pixis to see if you've got the larger sized vials. Um, it is a benzodiazepine. And so one thing that you wanna keep in mind is it has a long half-life. And so it can take a while for a patient to wake up once the medication stops. It can definitely cause um, a lowered respiratory rate, increased tidal volume and respiratory arrest in non-intubated patients. Be very cautious with this. I know midazolam can sometimes be used for seizure patients. Sometimes we can see it used for conscious sedation, but you really just wanna make sure that you're aware that it can cause pretty severe respiratory depression and failure. So always having that in the back of your mind is being prepared for it. And if you're using it on a patient that's intubated, then you've got that protection already because their airway is protected. But again, it can cause hypotension. So just be cautious. And it can cause anterior grade amnesia. So this can actually be a really nice one where let's say you had to escalate through a procedure pretty quickly. I've had patients before where um, say they're a trauma and they're needing to be intubated and have a chest tube placed and kind of have a lot of things happening at the same time. And maybe you weren't able to sedate them well enough for that chest tube before the chest tube went in and now you're moving to an intubation. Well, midazolam does a really nice job at, at um, causing anterior grade amnesia. So the patient doesn't actually remember a lot of the situation that might've been pretty traumatic for them. So um, it, it can be a beneficial medication in that sense that it just kind of helps to um, make the whole, the whole situation a little bit smoother for the patient. And then let's talk about pain, right? Because all of the other medications that we just talked about were really more focused on sedation. So let's talk about pain. We don't want to forget about pain. Um, fentanyl. I think a fentanyl infusion is great for most patients um, that are intubated and needing some pain control. You have a bolus range of about one to two mics per kilo. Um, and then your dose range is anywhere from 0 0.7 to 10 mics per kilo per hour. And we mix 1,000 mics in a 100 ml bag here. Again, if your patient's not intubated, they shouldn't be going on a fentanyl infusion, right? Because um, it causes respiratory depression and respiratory arrest. And so, um, you know, we do fentanyl boluses um, for pain, and that's completely appropriate. And again, you're just always making sure that you monitor for potential respiratory depression, but we don't do infusions on non-intubated patients here. Um, and the infusion bag should be secured so that the medication can't be accessed by anybody else. So you just go to pharmacy and ask for one of their lock boxes. Um, ketamine is another medication that we can use for pain. So it's a general anesthetic. It's a dissociative. It um, has both sedation and pain properties. And so it can work pretty nicely. We have a bolus range of anywhere from one to two milligrams per kilogram. And that you're really looking at is more of a 
like intubation induction, or if you were doing a conscious sedation, um, not really as much of an acute bolus like you're thinking with the propofol where the patient wakes up, they're biting the tube, they're getting a little crazy. You say, hey, I'm gonna, um, can I give them 10 milligrams IV push of propofol to help to just make sure that they get a little bit more sedated and the providers like, yeah, that sounds great. And then increase the infusion rate, fine. With ketamine boluses, um, it's not something that you do as often once they're on an infusion at least. And when you're doing it for a bolus for a procedure, um, then you usually just do the one dose and you don't actually have to repeat it again. So uh, don't be surprised if you don't see or aren't ordered boluses while you're on an infusion. Typical dose range for an infusion is five to 20 mics per kilo per minute. Uh, it's mixed in at 500 milligrams in a 500 ml bag. And there's a couple of things that I just want you to be aware of with this. If you're using it for an induction agent, rapid administration can cause respiratory depression, but really the more important thing is laryngospasms. So if you push ketamine really fast, and I'm talking like, whoop, it's in, um, it can cause pretty severe laryngospasms. And I actually had that happen with a patient one time and we had to wait out until the laryngospasm stopped before we were able to proceed in the intubation. And you just kind of feel a little stuck. Like there's nothing I can do. It's not like you never want to try and force anything past the vocal cords. So you're just waiting. You're, you're thinking, okay, do I give more of a paralytic to get this to resolve? Um, do I try to um, throw a little bit of oxygen down there? Just do like a very light bagging to see if it stimulates it to want to open up. You know, it, 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 it can put you in a pretty bad place. So just give it over about, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. Don't slam it in. Um, if you're doing it on a conscious sedation, realize that it can cause nystagmus. So that's that back and forth motion of the eyes and that very zoned outlook. Um, it can cause very increased sedations, especially at high doses. So be aware that you could suddenly have a patient that you're getting ready to intubate. You give them a full dose of ketamine and now they've got copious secretions. So make sure you have that suction ready and available. And it can actually be seen a little bit more. Uh, again, this is just anecdotal from what I've seen. Um, in kids than in adults. And so just really always keeping in mind that that could be a side effect that um, is coming from using this medication as your induction or your conscious sedation agent. And then you can also have emergence reactions. So people will call it the K-hole. Um, and that's when they have either just a little, not enough of the medication to actually keep them comfortable and sedated and they're, they're starting to break out of it. And so they can have really vivid hallucinations and, and delirium. And um, I mean, this years ago, like most medications, they can be abused. Um, and this was something that was called special K and that people would use at raves and parties because it made them have these hallucinations. Um, and so that can happen even when you're using the medication appropriately. And if it does, your patient can have violent and agitated and aggressive behavior suddenly that you weren't expecting. And midazolam is the counter agent for an emergent reaction. So um, if you know that you're using ketamine for a conscious sedation, maybe you just kind of keep in the back of your mind, hey doc, do you think we should pull some midaz to have at the bedside? Or is this going to be our plan um, if they do have an emergence reaction? Okay, so just to kind of wrap it up, um, all of the information that we had in this presentation came from a combination of up-to-date and um, consultation with our pharmacy and um, We've worked really hard at trying to get our drug library updated and make sure that it's compatible with some of the other local facilities and that we're doing the best that we can for our patient population. Um, but if you do wanna look up any more side effects or other considerations, up to date is a great place to um, go to. And then just as a final plug, um, keep in mind that your vasopressors and all of your sedation and pain medications are all compatible. So you can theoretically run all of those in the same line. Anytime you have something that's running off an IV pump that is titratable and that you consider a critical care medication, you wanna make sure that you don't run a bolus line through that as well, because it's going to affect the flow rate of your IV infusion. So if you think about it, let's say you've got Levifed running at 10 mics per minute, and it's just kind of chugging along. And then you say, I'm gonna do a liter bolus. And I'm gonna put that behind it. Well, now it's forcing uh, that leave a fed into the body faster than what the pump is actually providing. So you can have periods where you've got just saline in the line and then levo again and then saline and then levo. And once your uh, bolus stops, that again, fluid rate changes. So 
Um, if you're going to do a bolus, do it in a separate line. Anything that's running on an IV pump, keep on its own line. Um, and if you have any questions, please always reach out. You can always get one of these little mini ICU books. It's got all of the medications a little bit more specifically in there um, for your induction, for your infusions, for the sedation, the vasopressors, um, the antiarrhythmics, vasodilators. And then again, if you want a badge buddy to put on your badge with the medications listed as well as to how to mix it and what the ranges are, please reach out to me. I have plenty of these too. So uh, thank you all for attending and I'll see you next time.